we have convened this press conference because today is a significant day in the history of our country in relation to matters of governance and the democracy that we cherish. It is, of course, the day on which the Constitutional Court has ruled against the government on legislation that was rushed through Parliament, both through the House of Representatives and through the Senate, without the normal period for deliberation, rushed in in due haste for what we regard as a motive to ensure that the current DPP could remain in office for a longer period than the Constitution contemplated. We felt that the procedure that was embarked upon by the government was fundamentally wrong, and the substance of what was being done was also invalid. And we decided to take the matter to the Constitutional Court, for the court to rule on it. The reason we did this is because, first of all, as parliamentarians, we all swear an oath or affirm to uphold and defend the Constitution of the country. And we're living in times where we have a government which likes to play fast and loose with the constitutional rights of our citizens and with the normal principles of good democratic governance in the country. This is not the first occasion on which the opposition has had to play this role of assiduously guarding the Constitution from a government that is intent on violating it in various ways. There were, for example, the Mids case, the case of the Mids legislation, which again was rushed through Parliament with undue haste when we warned the government that it violated constitutional rights of our citizens to privacy in the form in which it had been presented to Parliament. They chose to ignore our request to have that legislation be properly reviewed by a joint select committee, and we had to take it to court, and the entire legislation was struck down by the Constitutional Court, and the government had to wheel and come again and bring new legislation to deal with the question of a national ID. There, of course, are the state of emergency and the use of the states of emergency by this government, which we have said is not consistent with our Constitution, and we have brought proceedings before the Constitutional Court to test their use of it, and those are pending proceedings which will come to trial in due course. There's also an earlier test of the constitutionality of the state of emergency brought by a young man called Lupin Clark, where the court ruled in his favor and awarded substantial compensation because he had been detained under the state of emergency in circumstances which the court agreed were not in keeping with the Constitution. And there have been other instances, the attempt to appoint a chief justice on a probationary basis, unheard of in the history of Jamaica and indeed other jurisdictions, which civil society and ourselves objected to fundamentally as violating the separation of powers principle, where the prime minister took it on himself to think he had jurisdiction or power or authority to review the performance of a chief justice and decide whether or not he should continue in office. And before that, there were these undated letters of resi resignation signed by JLP appointed senators as an attempt to give the prime minister leverage over them in relation to the CCG legislation that was being brought by the then government of the People's National Party. And those were tested by two, I think it was, or certainly one or two senators on their side when the letters were used by the Prime Minister to remove them. And that was held to be an improper device and a violation of the Constitution. So we have been vigilant in a variety of matters, and this most recent one is very, very important. It is groundbreaking because this was a bill to amend the Constitution that they passed, and the basis upon which it was challenged was because we felt that the way in which it was seeking to do this
was both for improper motive, but also was in violation of the constitutional arrangements to do with how a DPP um, can have her tenure in office extended. As you know, the current DPP had received a three-year extension prior to her 60th birthday in accordance with the procedure that the Constitution provides, and the Governor General approved of that extension. And her tenure of office should have ended in September last year, which was the end of that three-year period. The government, for reasons which one can only speculate about, sought in July last year, just before the summer break, to rush through this legislation to extend the, to amend the Constitution, not only to say that future DPPs and Auditors General would retire at the age of 65 rather than 60, but also to apply that to the existing incumbents. And it, that is where they violated the Constitution. And that attempt was struck down today by the Constitutional Court. It is quite clear that the tenure of the existing officer that has been holding that position since September last year came to an end, that the intent to extend it was invalid and unconstitutional. And I therefore call upon the Services Commission to proceed with alacrity to embark on the process for appointing a new DPP, the advertising, etc., should be done. And in the meantime, that the Governor General acting on their advice, the Service Commission advice, should appoint somebody to act in the position. Ladies and gentlemen, this is just part of what has been happening in our country in terms of gross violations of the normal precepts of good parliamentary democracy and good government. We know about, for example, the situation in our parliament in relation to the former clerk who on the eve of her retirement, after decades of service to the parliament and to the people of Jamaica as clerk to the House of Parliament, was the recipient of a letter, which wasn't a private affair, but was emailed to all parliamentarians and became public immediately, castigating her, criticizing her in relation to the issue of how reports which come to parliament from the Auditor General in this case were being dealt with and saying that she had committed essentially a disciplinary infraction by not carrying out the ruling of the speaker and that the letter would be put on her file. As it turned out, the speaker had to back down on that issue of those reports and they were indeed, when the Auditor General sent them back to Parliament, the reports having been returned to the Auditor General, when they came back to Parliament, they had to be tabled and they were tabled. And they were terrible in circumstances are inconsistent with that ruling, a ruling which we think is flawed, and we've said so all along, and we are calling once again for the opinion of the Attorney General's Chambers on this matter, which we've been asking for for months and months, to be released to all parliamentarians so we can see what the Attorney General's Chambers said about the procedure for tabling reports. And this is a matter which we will be looking at closely as to whether we're going to have to take this matter to the court for a ruling as well. But in the meantime, we're asking once again for this legal opinion to be released. That opinion is not an opinion belonging to the Speaker. The Speaker acts on behalf of Parliament in seeking the legal advice of the Attorney General on a matter which affects all members of Parliament, and indeed all parliamentarians, including itself. And the opinion that was granted or issued by the Attorney General should be shared with all parliamentarians so we can see what the principal legal advisor to the government has said on this matter. Ladies and gentlemen, I would also just mention there are other issues that we have been raising of great concern. The role of the political ombudsman and the way in which that has been conflated into the Electoral Commission of Jamaica, making the Electoral Commissioners collectively as a body the political ombudsman is a flawed approach. We objected to it when the legislation was brought to Parliament, and it was rushed through again in, with indecent haste. And of course, it has not worked, because the local government elections have come and gone, and they were unable to effectively play any role in dealing with the kind
and the issues of the political ombudsman is established to deal with. Issues which are highly contentious, um, often involve partisan considerations, and which ought not to be brought under the ECJ, which is a body established to ensure consensus between the major political parties on electoral matters, so as to reduce tensions and ensure that our democracy can function in a way that is in keeping with good governance, law and order, and a peaceful society. Coming out of a history that we are all aware of, where political violence was a big problem in this country in the past. So this is another issue where we feel the government has gone down a very wrong path. But they are stubborn and headstrong. And it is only when we take them to court and win there that they have to reconsider, wheel, and come again, as was done with NIDS, and as will have to be done with the DPP. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. My two colleagues, Senator Scott Markley, Member of Parliament Philip Fogel, who was one of the two co-applicants in the case. The case was brought by our leader of opposition business in the House, Philip Fogel, MP, and our leader of opposition, opposition business in the Senate, Senator Peter Bunting, who is unable to be with us this afternoon. Uh, and, but it was a, a case that was brought to uphold and defend the constitution of the country, principles of good governance, and to avoid the manipulation of the power of the majority and the tyranny of the majority in Parliament to undermine good governance in this country. And that is something that we will consistently and strenuously resist as opposition in accordance with our duty to the people of Jamaica. Thank you.